three hikes is still a good baseline. Our monetary policy is focused on getting inflation back down to 2%. Perhaps, you know, inflation is not going to be as transitory as forecast. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Some don't like it hot. Some more Fed voices call for rate hikes as the urgency over inflation grows. Now, a cyber attack hits Ukrainian government websites. The hack comes as tensions with Russia surge. Natural gas prices also surge. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition because this hour we'll be speaking exclusively to the chairman and founder of the vaccine maker Moderna. He's Nubar Afayan. Send in your questions on IB. Plus TV Go. Now, first thing is first, so let's check in on the markets, and we're seeing a repricing, or certainly a correction when it comes to European stocks. This falls a pretty big correction also in the U.S., especially in technology stocks. But you can see the European technology industry or sector is still under pressure, 1.3 percent lower. We have seen that movement, but it's one of the first days where we actually have a complete um, risk-off mood. Also, commodities being sold off. Watch out for dollar. It did weaken 1, 1,162. We decided to look at the uh, Bloomberg U.S. spot dollar and then you can see some of the other things that we're watching out for is gas prices. So of course what we're looking at is the fact that we had many Fed officials coming and saying look we need to be more aggressive with inflation so there's not more hikes priced in but the timing of it could be brought forward. Uh, the FTSE down some 0.1 percent and then you can see the CAC actually eight tenths of a percent lower also because of EDF and that has to do with gas prices. We'll have plenty more on that throughout the program. A little bit of data. German GDP growing some 2.7% in 2021. I don't know whether it has huge impact, of course, on euro. The 10-year German bond uh, practically unchanged, uh, minus negative 0.076. The story here is that we'll have a differential play if uh, something political happens in France that the markets don't like, or Italy. Remember, we choose a new president in Italy on January. 24th, or at least the starting of the vote is there. Euro dollar again, this will reprice a lot of the commodities, 114.67. And one of the stories that we're trying to figure out is if there's more pressure on dollar, what does it mean for your emerging market asset classes? So, Fed chiefs say they're open to raising interest rates as early as March to ensure that near 40 year high price pressures are brought under control. I definitely see rate increases coming as early as March even. Three hikes is still a good baseline. Uh, we will have to wait and see what inflation looks like in the second half of the year. We need to get inflation back down in the ballpark of our 2% objective. Our monetary policy is focused on getting inflation back down to 2% while sustaining a recovery that includes everyone. This is our most important task. Well, we're now joined by Agnès Belash, Chief European Strategist at Bearings and Bloomberg's Christina Kino to go through the markets and everything that we've seen in between. So thank you both for joining us. Christine, I don't know how much more correction or repricing we need, but it does seem that every day we have more Fed officials saying, look, they worry about inflation, and it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere, so they'll have to be more aggressive. Absolutely, Francine. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you were saying that while it doesn't necessarily add up to more rate hikes getting priced in at the moment, it's going to be all about the timing and you know we have that March Fed meeting as the first focal point for the potential first rate hike and so I think for throughout the rest of the year particularly in the first half it will be quite interesting to see how those expectations in the markets versus the the commentary from FOMC officials play out in terms of the next timing for the subsequent rate rises beyond March. So Agnes do you worry about this entrenched inflation and actually what does it mean for the markets are we going to see a correction with the Fed acting much more aggressively? Aggressively. Yeah, it's absolutely true. All, all what investors want to talk about is the Fed. So that's also what I'm thinking a lot about. Um, am I worried about the pace? Not really. The amount is still very small, and they're telegraphing what they're going to do really clearly. But I think what matters is what happens to growth as inflation remains high. And, um, and, and so these are the two scenarios I'm thinking about, if you have a minute. The first one is, what happens if growth slows down, but inflation remains high? And I think investors want to know that the Fed has their back, and they're not going to go for inflation without caring for growth. And in that, I, I, I remember the word uh, optionality. And if optionality is repeated, 
i.e. that the Fed will not do as much uh, as three rate hikes or four rate hikes that are priced in, then the market can take risks and it feels secured. But the second question that is more relevant is what happens if growth continues to be strong and above trend and inflation remains high? And um, the question here for, for, for investors is, will the Fed manage this delicate balance of not uh, killing grow, growth too much while fighting inflation. And I think so far the Fed has a really right. strong credibility in its record and outside with they're going to know what to do. Yeah, Chrissy, I mean, this is a problem, right, is that they have a lot of credibility at the moment until there's a policy mistake. So I don't know whether markets are now nervous about a policy mistake because they say, look, we'll be careful. I mean, they have a dual mandate, which should make things also a little bit easier unless the economy doesn't pan out like they forecast it. Absolutely, Francine. And I think Agnes is very right in pointing out it really is all about that balance between growth and inflation, particularly when we get into that situation or if we get into that situation of growth slowing down, but inflation not easing. You know, this is the dreaded stagflation sort of scenario that we really saw a lot of uh, last year, particularly when we were talking about the UK economy and the Bank of England considering rate hikes. And so it could be interesting if such a situation replicates itself for the Fed and in the U.S. I mean, at the moment, the focus is really on inflation and those ramp up in rate hikes. But you could expect questions about longer term growth and what this all means if we do get those four rate hikes coming through this year. Yeah. And what does it mean for treasuries? And yes, again, I feel like we've been talking about a repricing in treasuries for what, 18, 24 months, if not longer. Is this a quarter where we really get it? Where we get what higher rates? I think if if the Fed, you know, <laughs> high, uh, hikes rates, uh, you know, three or four times, rates should the ten-year yield should really go around two, but not much more. The Fed hasn't been that hawkish uh, so far. It's just about the market getting used to it and feeling that it has enough reassurance on the downside scenario. And and what we know is that on the other side of this inflation spike um, is pretty good growth. Uh, with prolonged growth, with high buffers, less supply disruptions, less exogenous inflation pressures from all these things that central banks cannot control. It, it is, I know we talked a little bit about Bitcoin, but is this, the, you know, does it get tested as really now the hedge? you know, against inflation, which really not a lot of people saw coming, frankly, Christine. Absolutely, Francine. I think there will be a lot of people arguing against the idea of Bitcoin as an inflation hedge, probably your more traditional gold bugs out there uh, challenging that notion. But, you know, it has been uh, put forward as an alternative, so you can't discount that. But, no, I think you're absolutely right. You know, this really will be the first time that Bitcoin will be operating in that sort of environment of higher rates. For the, the last few years during its rise, it hasn't really seen that environment, right? It's been a very accommodative policy environment. This will be the first time it will be in that environment of higher rates. So it'll be interesting to see how it pans out and whether it can stand up to the pressure. Yeah, I find it amazing. And it's amazing to see also some of the boomers actually now changing their mind about Bitcoin. Christina Kino, as always, thank you so much. Smart on the markets. And Agnes Belesh, Chief European Strategist at Bearings, stays with us. Now, Smart Conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we speak exclusively to the chairman and founder of the vaccine maker Moderna, Nubar Afayan, send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. But up next, Moscow says talks with the West are, quote, at a dead end. We discuss the impact on the European energy market. So that's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, we're also getting some live pictures, of course, from Russia. The Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, has been holding his annual press conference. Now, the big, uh, well, the big question is really Russia has been at the forefront of a pretty busy week when it comes to geopolitics. Uh, conversations with the U.S. and NATO did not go maybe as well as certain politicians were expecting or hoping for. And, of course, a lot of questions also on whether the EU will link Nord Stream 2 to any possible 
possible sanctions because of what Russia could do with Ukraine. Now, Ukraine also says a cyber attack has brought down the website of several government agencies and authorities didn't comment on the source of the outage, which comes as tensions with Russia surge as thousands of troops continue to build up near the border with Ukraine. Now, meetings this week with Russia have failed to shed light on Moscow's intentions. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this is Ross Matheson, our global government executive editor. Ross, I know you've had a busy week like most weeks, but are things any clearer with Russia on Ukraine after the talks this week? Well, as you were saying, not really. Despite a week of talks involving a variety of players from NATO to European nations to the US directly, it's still a mystery exactly what is uh, Putin's intentions. And the only person who seems to know what might happen next from Russia is the president himself. And perhaps he likes the idea of keeping people guessing. Uh, he's, of course, insisting on guarantees from NATO in order to not invade Ukraine. NATO, in turn, says it cannot give those guarantees. So they've got the chance to air their points of view this week, but they have moved no closer in terms of what action might be taken to defuse the situation. In fact, the Russian rhetoric yesterday seemed to be hardening, if anything, and that was unnerving financial markets a bit. So the ball is really still in Putin's court at this point in time. Uh, will be there, There's no plan for further discussions, although both sides say they're open to that happening. Um, meanwhile, the U.S. is, is put, putting the pressure on the Europeans to agree to a, a potential sanctions package if he does invade Ukraine. The idea is to ramp up the deterrence there to stop some sort of action from happening, perhaps in the next couple of weeks. So, uh, Roz, what does it mean actually for, first of all, is it almost a given, like certain leaders have said, is it almost a given that there will be an invasion of Russia into Ukraine, and are, are world leaders prepared for that? And, you know, this hack on the Ukrainian government sites, how does that play into the already very high tensions? Well, there's very mixed views about the risk of an invasion. Um, he's put troops on the border before and then withdrawn them again without invading. He very much sees Ukraine as part of Russia, and perhaps the long-term goal is to try and absorb it somehow. Uh, but it's very unclear if he actually will go in or not. He can achieve some goals just by having his troops sit there. Um, the, the concern for Europe and others is that he doesn't invade necessarily, but that he just keeps the tension high uh, into perpetuity, uh, perhaps by cyber attacks on Europe and Ukraine, perhaps by trying to destabilise Ukraine from within. And to that point, the, the hacks that we've seen today on the Ukrainian government websites are probably highlight the fact that he may not need to invade Ukraine to get some results. Um, of course, Russia has not been officially blamed for this attack, but it comes at a, at a delicate time in their relationship, yeah. to say the least. So that's the concern. Uh, even if he doesn't invade, does it, does it just keep nerves high, tensions high, and Europe in a high state of alert as a result? Ros, thank you so much for all of the insights. And I urge everyone, of course, to also follow uh, the great team coverage that Ros and her team are putting together. You can do it on the website or on the terminal. Ros Matheson, our executive editor for Global Government. Now let's get back to Agnes Balash, chief European strategist at Bearings. Agnes, I mean, the, the concern is that over the last couple of decades, a lot of these geopolitical concern, even when China's involved, just hasn't translated into the market. Now it seems it's much more current because of the natural gas prices. How does this play out in the next couple of quarters? Yeah, so I think on the investor side, the worries are not that high because maybe contrary to what the media uh, seem to be reporting, there's no real fear that Russia invades Ukraine. Ukraine is the size of France. Um, it would be very dangerous for Russia. Uh, Putin, we know, hasn't prepared his, his population for fatalities uh, in war. You know, it, it's something else that is playing out there. It, you know, Putin is thinking about his legacy and he wants uh, to secure the European order in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's just using Ukraine to bring the U.S. to the table. He has very little leverage, really, and he's playing a weak hand strong. Um, and we know from the past and from history that Eurasia is, is really important for the stability of Europe. So I'm not sure right now he wants to destabilize it. And, um, yeah. and I think Europe as well you know, knows that this is all about a discussion about it. So you, you want to talk about gas prices, and indeed that, that's quite important, but there are many things happening on the gas front. So yeah. gas prices have so increased guess, also because they are... Yeah, so how do, yes. you, how do you play that, actually, from, from a strategist's point of view? 
Yeah, so, so of course it's something to monitor, but it's it's uh, it's it's probably some something that has to do with Ukraine and investing uh, in emerging market bonds that have to do with Ukraine, and if they sell off, um, putting on the the call that they actually will that it will not be invaded, and it's a strong country that all interests want to defend, all sides actually want to defend, and not, nothing bad is really going to happen. Um, Ukraine is actually a, a paying a really good return, and it's it's, it's quite a stable country that's that's doing a lot of good things economically. Um, so I think that right. really that, that's what's happening right now in terms of investing. Um, and yes, how do you play? I don't know how much lower the dollar you think will go and what that means for emerging markets. Yeah, so the interesting, interesting thing about emerging markets this year is that they have been raising interest rates since uh, the first quarter of 2021. They've had more than 60... Uh, occurrences of interest rate hikes and actually the you know the local economies uh, are returning quite high local interest rates um, so this provides in those countries where the central bank has a strong credibility uh, this provides uh, soon a good entry point uh, in local currency em bonds uh, the fx side um, is of course a little bit more delicate so that exposure can be taken or hedged depending on you know the country you you enter um, and yes, we're just getting some, so first of all, GDP out of Germany, and it does seem that the recovery has lagged some of their European counterparts because of inflation and supply chain concerns. And according to the statistical office on the ground in Germany, uh, the economy also likely shrank in the fourth quarter. Are you worried about Europe as an investment opportunity? I know there's, you know, valuations are much more attractive than elsewhere in the world, but how do, will this play out in 2022? Yeah, so, so Europe, as we were just talking before, has a much more attractive growth inflation mix. Um, there are no uh, big transport disruptions like there are in the U.S. There's no big uh, shortage of truckers or containers. There's no issue with ports. Um, there are uh, shortages in computer chips coming from Asia because of the uh, you know, labor issues there due to Omicron and, and previous waves. Um, but there's massive order books for automakers in, in Germany. So the future past this hump uh, should be actually pretty good. In addition... The, the labor market doesn't have the issues that the U.S. has, which is shortage of labor. In fact, yeah. the participation rate is higher than it was pre-crisis, and unemployment rate is actually quite low. It's probably as low as it was at the start of, uh, of, of the euro. So uh, Europe is actually in, a, in an easier uh, central bank position for uh, you know for, for investors to to guess and to play around and indeed there are lots of large cap companies that are able to pass through increased price by equity investment yes. thank you so much Thank you so much for joining us. Agnes Belesh there, Chief European Strategist at Bearings. Now, Smart Conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we speak exclusively to the chairman and founder of the vaccine maker Moderna, Nubar Afayam. Send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, after years of weakening returns, Goldman Sachs' commodities desk revenue shot past $2.2 billion in the final months of 2021, topping a windfall it generated in 2020 for its strongest performance in a decade. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's energy and commodities uh, reporter, also author of a wonderful book he co-wrote with uh, Javier Blast, World for Sale. He is Jack Farkey. Jack, thank you for joining us. So how have the fortunes of Goldman's commodities Commodity traders actually changed. Well, Francine, uh, it's been one of the great psychodramas on Wall Street in the past few years. Goldman's commodity desk, once one of the great engines of its profitability uh, for many years, and this source of so many of the top executives at the bank, uh, really faltered in 2017. It had its worst year in 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 two decades. The top executives at the bank were considering what its future held, maybe even to axe the desk altogether. Uh, it was a tough time, an awful lot of people left. But now, largely thanks to COVID and the huge volatility in energy prices we've seen over the past two years, uh, it's back on top of the world. It had its best year in, in more than a decade, uh, and its boss, Ed Emerson, is going to be one of the best paid people in Goldman Sachs and probably one of the best paid people uh, at Wall Street banks uh, all over the, uh, around Wall Street. 
Jack, it's such a good story, and actually, you know, it's one of our most read stories on the Bloomberg Terminal. What is the significance of this commodity unit, Goldman, in the bank's history? Well, for, for many years, it was one of the most profitable bits of, of the bank, uh, and uh, Goldman bought uh, a commodity trader called Jay Aaron in the 1980s. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a, a, a historic uh, coffee trader that had been started in the in the 19th century. And through this unit, the still known by some Goldman insiders as Jay Aaron, uh, a lot of the bank's top executives came. It was a kind of um, training yeah. ground for the for the top track. So people like Gary Cohn, Lloyd Blankfein, Isabel Ille, um, all came up through the commodities unit, and really, you know. We're defending it Jack. very strongly through through that tough period in 2017. Yep. Jack, thank you so much. We'll have plenty more on the story throughout the day. This is Bloomberg. Some do not like it hot. More Fed voices call for rate hikes as the urgency over inflation grows. A cyber attack hits Ukrainian government websites while the hack comes as tensions with Russia surge. Natural gas prices also surge. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour we speak exclusively to the chairman and founder of vaccine maker Moderna, Nubar Afayan. And you can send in your questions for him on IB Plus TV Go. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, first of all, let's check in on the markets. So we're seeing a bit of repricing, certainly when it comes to European equities. I also have a great chart, actually. Uh, Mr. Peter Obenheimer from Goldman Sachs looking at some of the valuations, especially in Europe and how they contend with the rest of the world, saying, look, 2022 is not going to be a bad year for European equities, but maybe we won't have the same returns as 2021. Still, pressure down six-tenths of a percent for European stocks after Fed officials came in saying, look, they worry about inflation. They may have to do a bit more in rates, not in terms of how many, but maybe the timing of that. So we keep an eye, of course, on everything that's going on with assets. Now, natural gas prices in Europe have jumped to the highest level in a week. That's as fears of possible military action in Ukraine raise concerns that Russian supplies may be even more limited in the coming months. Now, Russian credit default swaps have also blown up overnight, a sign that the market is concerned about possible sanctions. Well, we are delighted, I'm especially delighted, to be joined by Kevin Daly, he's co-head of CE, MEA Economics at Goldman Sachs. So, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, you certainly cover a part of the region which is not dull at all. How much does it have to do with inflation, uh, you know, COVID, and actually growth forecast? And how much is it just now politics and the impact this has on Russia credit default swaps? Well, I mean, for the region, I mean, it depends on which part of the region. I mean, for the region as a whole, we're actually pretty optimistic for growth this year. Uh, we're well above uh, consensus uh, for Simia region, 4.2 versus 3.8 consensus uh, expected. Um, I mean, the, but it's, we think the going will be a lot tougher this year. We have uh, still, we think, uh, the, a boost from the unwinding of pandemic effects. Um, but then against that, we have the impact of much tighter global financial conditions dri driven by the Fed tightening. I mean, that's both going to damage growth, we think, and, and so weigh in growth. So we think growth will be slower in most economies this year than it was last year. Um, and it's also a major risk for, for EM assets uh, through this year. Yeah. So we're, we're pretty cautious on that front. So what kind of inflation expectation are you expecting in Russia? Does it realign? It was one of the highest, actually, in the past, especially hitting consumption and possible you know, unrest amongst the population. What happens in 2022 and beyond? Yeah, so for Russia specifically, I mean, it's, it's, I mean we're, we expect inflation to, to remain pretty high in, in the short term. We've had, um, you know, the central bank has already raised rates by 425 basis points to eight and a half. They maintain a very, you know, hawkish line and that, the, you know, the risk, geopolitical risks around uh, the currency uh, potentially raise the possibility of further upward pressure on, on inflation. Um, our forecast is that they will, you know, we are at the peak in rates, but we think the risks are clearly skewed towards further tightening in the short run. We do expect towards the end of the year inflation to begin to decline um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, quite markedly. Um, but, you know, for now, at least we think, you know, given high inflation rates we're seeing currently, given those geopolitical risks, we think the CBR is going to remain pretty hawkish. 
Uh, when you look at the Turkish Central Bank, I mean, that was definitely not dull over the last couple of months, uh, Kevin. Does it, you know, does it change course and then tighten monetary policy? That's, I mean, that is our view. I mean, you know, in our view, the current situation is, isn't entirely unsustainable. We have, um, you know, although policy rates, uh, you know, seemingly high at 14 percent, inflation rose to 36 percent in December. We think on our forecast that it will rise above 40 percent next month, possibly above 50 percent in, in the coming months. You know, so you're talking about a, a negative real rate as, as far as the domestic households and corporates are concerned. Of minus 30, minus 40 percent. That, that, in our mind, is unsustainable. We think it's going to result in further uh, depreciation pressures on the Turkish lira. In that environment, I mean, the big question is in that environment: Does you know do the Turkish authorities do they respond in a you know in a conventional or orthodox fashion uh, by tightening monetary policy, or do they continue with their still very unorthodox policies or heterodox policies, as they describe them, um, and implement you know some degree of, of what essentially amounts to uh, quasi-capital controls. Um, I mean, that remains to be seen, but ev even with administrative measures to, to tighten outflows, we, we think they're gonna have to reverse course on monetary policy and ultimately tighten uh, raise rates very significantly. Yeah, and overall, that's you know the, the the question that a lot of investors asked, which many also got out of the country um, after a lot of pain that they felt. I mean, Kevin, overall, and I want to talk about some of the individual countries, but overall, what happens to dollar because that will also dictate how emerging markets outperform. And it, you know, because of dollar weakness, do you have a, a favorite country to be invested in? So. Uh... I mean, it's, it, you know, clearly with, with tighter financial conditions, where it is very much a theme for us for this year is to, is to choose your places very carefully. It's not a, I don't think it is an environment where you can be bullish on EM assets in, in general. Um, we tend to, let's say in CE rates in particular, we think that there's a lot. Um, so Czech, Poland, Hungary, we think there's a lot of further tightening there still to come. You know, given that inflation in our mind is likely to move sharply higher in the coming months, so we would like to pay uh, front end rate, rates there. We think, you know, on 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 by contrast, in South Africa, we think the market is pricing in too much tightening. So, you know, given you know relatively weak underlying inflationary dynamics, we quite like to receive rates there. The the really interesting one is the ruble. I mean, the ruble yeah. is, you know, for us is that. You know, the economic case to be bullish to ruble is, is immense, is that you have, uh, you know, a very hawkish central bank, you have high oil prices, you have a very healthy current account surplus, um, and, you know, fair value, we estimate for dollar ruble to be 58, so that's like more than 30% stronger for yeah. the ruble than we currently have. But set against that, you know, while these geopolitical risks remain exceptionally high as they currently are, we're, you know, we're waiting for the opportunity for those hopefully to die down and to, you know, to, to go along the ruble at that stage. So, Kevin, if it doesn't die down and we have some sort of invasion, which is not priced in at the moment of Russian troops into Ukraine, what happens to, you know, uh, Ukraine FX reserves or some of the assets in that country? No, I, I mean, it, I mean, clearly that would be, you know, significantly negative, uh, both for, you know, Russian assets, the ruble and Ukrainian assets. Actually, interestingly, you know, the Ukraine, Ukrainian assets, or Ukraine, Ukrainian CDS, for instance, has sold off much, much more uh, already than than Russia has. So, you know, if, if you are looking for you know, an asset to, uh, you know, to, to bet on the, or to, to trade on the unwinding of that risk, actually it's probably more um, uh, opportunity in, in Ukraine than there is in Russia. We think as it relates to, you know, this week's developments, actually I think in, in, to some degree there was some complacency in, in, in some Russian assets in, in, in terms of the expectation uh, that there would be a breakthrough yeah. this week, we thought was unlikely. Why do you think it's unlikely? Because, you know, of the distance between the two sides is, remains immense. Uh, the fact that the negotiations were taking place at a deputy foreign minister level suggested to us that a breakthrough this week was unlikely. Yeah. I think the best you could have hoped for this week is, was that they would continue talking, you know, and for mm -hmm. now at least they are doing that.
Kevin, thank you so much. As always, Kevin Daly, their co-head of CEMEA Economics at Goldman Sachs. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash with Leanne Gertz. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. The French government has told the state-controlled utility EDF to sell more power at a deep discount to protect households from ballooning prices. The unprecedented move will cost the company as much as 8.4 billion euros. In a separate development, EDF says several of its nuclear power plants in France will be down longer than expected for repairs, prompting it to slash its reactor output forecast by 8%. The commodities desk at Goldman Sachs has made a comeback with revenue expected to top $2.2 billion in 2021. That compares to just $300 million in 2017, less than a tenth of its heyday. Goldman's energy traders have profited from the wild ride in energy markets during the pandemic. And that's your blue Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Liam, thank you so much. Up next, we speak to Moderna's chairman and co-founder, Nubar Afayan, about the pandemic and, of course, the future of biotechnology. Send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, earlier this week, Moderna said it expects sales of its vaccine products to rise in 2022. In an interview with Bloomberg TV, the chief executive said its Omicron-specific booster could enter into human trials within weeks. Now, Moderna's chairman and co-founder, Nubar Afayan, has also released his first annual letter. Now, in it, he says the world is not yet in the pandemic's wake. Now, he also sees programmable medicines and the convergence of biology and AI as the future and I am delighted to be joined now by Nubar Afayan. Thank you so much for joining us. Nubar, we have a lot to get through. I have many questions of course on AI, biology, how that changes in the future. But is 2022 the year where the pandemic becomes endemic and does Omicron help with that because it spreads so much faster that we'll have natural immunity? Well first thanks for having me Francine and uh, I think that uh, 2022 may be the year that the pandemic enters an endemic phase, but it really depends on what happens and the decisions that are made across the world. As we've seen with Omicron, uh, we were surprised. Uh, basically, on the one hand, there's a fairly massive uh, transmittal rate. On the other hand, it's having a, a lesser effect in terms of seriousness of disease. And so that are encouraging in some ways, but I think that we have to be, stay very vigilant in order to get to that place during 2022. So it is the immunity that's provided by natural infection very different from some of the vaccines? And actually, again, does that change the, the way that we describe this pandemic going forward? Most of the data that I've seen seems to suggest that the vaccines, particularly the mRNA vaccines, uh, provide a stronger level of immunity than the natural infection. As a result, two things happen. One, you have antibodies in your body for a period of time that can work on preventing the infection in the first place. And two, you have T cells and other cells in your body that are prepared to fight the infection. So the effect, the double effect there, really seems to be quite robust. Uh, one of them has a time sensitivity of a few months. That's mm -hmm. why we're talking about boosters. So when will you have an Omicron vaccine ready? I know Pfizer said March, and will we need that vaccine? You know, again, I think people are making uh, 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 guesses at this, and I'd say we, our job as a developer and manufacturer, and as you know, we were the first to really pioneer this technology over the last decade, uh, is to create possibilities, and then it's really government's jobs and public health officials' yeah. jobs to decide how to deploy them. So we will be ready with our testing in uh, starting in weeks, but but it's not a very very long process. But now we have to look at the seasonal effects and expectations. And whether we need a booster rather in the spring than the fall is something that we're going to have to work with officials all around the world to sort out. Yeah, and that's fair enough. So what, what volumes of, of this vaccine, if it gets given the green light, can you actually produce in what time frame? We've said that our capacity and the forward investments we've made uh, provide the company, Moderna, the ability to produce something on the range of 2 billion to up to 3 billion doses. 
depending on the volume of dose that we use, the dose amounts that we use. And that further depends on which vaccine we're making, because now increasingly the, the first, second doses uh, are, you know, we've vaccinated quite a few people in the world, and the booster can be a smaller dose. So I think it's going to be between 2 billion, perhaps going up to 3 if needed. That's around the levels we're looking at. So how much of, you know, all of your volumes for 2022 will go to low middle income countries? And what does that mean for your gross profitability? You know, I, this is something that we've talked about throughout last fall, and it's it's been a debate around the need on the one hand and the abundance of vaccine that's flowing to low income countries on the other hand. We are, as we've said publicly, very actively working with COVAX with several hundred million doses there. We've made announcements with the African Union. But at the same time, what we find is in certain places, there is an abundance of vaccine that's, that, that's come into those countries. And so governments are looking at what they need now versus what they may need later. And that will dictate what percentage of our vaccine, our particular vaccine, will go to low-income countries. Somehow that's been turned into a willingness or a preparedness to deal with these countries. I can tell you, you know, yet again, that, uh, very, very clearly that the reason we scaled up our production was in order to be able to provide as many doses as were needed. And with two to three billion from us and even more from, from Pfizer and, and BioNTech, we think there's enough mRNA vaccine to vaccinate the whole world and has been for a little while. The right. problem is we need to sort out the logistics of getting these vaccines into people's arms. And, and I think far too little is being discussed there. And that's where there's a lot of work to do uh, between yeah. governments. And so we'll do our part, but we really hope the rest is done. Well, we certainly try on our part, and I tried, you know, you know, to keep it in the media conversation. Nilbar, overall, I mean, there's now, of course, some people saying that, you know, a, a, another booster too quickly to the first one would hurt your immune system. Like, how do we have a complete picture of how many vaccines we need with, you know, is it every three months? Is it every year? And the longer-term impact on the immune system? I'd like to say two things about that. First, you know, this is science that's being prosecuted in real time. And so we really need to make sure that our forward guesses as to, or rather let's call them predictions, as to what may or may not happen doesn't uh, uh, supersede the science. And we are making, I mean, the interesting thing is there's hundreds of thousands or millions of, of individuals whose data in a real world evidence way we can use to rapidly make these determinations. So yes, there is an immunological basis to say how many doses, how frequently, and we need to study that. I don't think anybody knows that answer up front, yeah. so we have to be doing the work. But but the important other thing we have to look at is that we can't treat every person the same. There are people with immune right. compromised conditions, there's people with various other comorbidities. So I think being nuanced around who gets additional doses and how frequently is going to be the next wave. And for that, we need better measurements. You know, we're, we're all as a society now talking about getting tests for the COVID uh, uh, virus, yeah. but I think we also need tests for the COVID vaccine tests for the antibody right. levels so that we know what to do. Nubar, thank you so much. Of course, we'll get back to Moderna's chairman and co-founder, Nubar Afeyan. I have his first annual letter in my hands. It's a must read, so you have this. And then, of course, in a couple of weeks, we'll also have the Jamie Dimon, the two annual letters that you can't miss. Up next, we continue the conversation with Nubar Afeyan, and you can send in your questions on, of course, biotech, on the linkage between artificial intelligence and how all this plays out thanks to mRNA. You can send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go, or you can tweet me on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, still with us, Nubar Afayan, founder of Moderna, who's just told us that 2022 may also see the pandemic turn into an endemic. And Nubar, you also wrote your first annual letter that came out yesterday, late yesterday. I have to say, it's it's a pleasure to read it. It's nine short pages. It's not complicated, but you tackle some very important subjects like biology and AI and what humanity faces once the pandemic is actually over. You also look at the you know the hunt for value and the biotech business environment. First of all, why write an annual letter? What do, does the media and markets not understand about biotech and what this pandemic can teach us? 
Francine, the, there's, there's really two, two ways we thought about it. One, as you mentioned, it is indeed the case that biotech has been thrust into a broader awareness globally. And it's, been, it's done so through COVID and through a particular vaccine. But broadly, there are trends that will impact our health overall at a time when we really desperately need it. And so it's important to catch the moment and figure out how can we have much bigger impact, not only on a pandemic that's a fast one, but also all the slow pandemics, otherwise known as broad diseases, obesity, cancer, et cetera. So that's one reason. It's a biotech-centric view. The second reason is we find ourselves at a cross-section, a crossroads of many, many flows of, of, of forces and opportunities. And getting that out there to spur a discussion was a second reason to, to take this on. But Anubar, I mean, I guess there's a, quite a lot of, you know, recent mRNA deals that we've seen. And you, you look at, you know, the hunt for value and some of the business concerns surrounding that. It shows interest, of course, in the modality, but it also shows how easy it seems for competitors to get into this. What is the future of mRNA? mRNA really is the first a substantial example of a programmable medicine. And I think we need to look at the future as as that uh, era in, in drug development. Programmable medicine means that if you can think about the drug as something you can very rapidly reconfigure or make for purpose and make and test, then the whole premise for the pharma industry, which is these years and years of unending testing and uncertainty, are diminished dramatically. And the impact that has on, on how people deploy resources towards it, what society can expect from it, it's a completely new game. So mRNA really enabled that. No drugs before, no proteins, no small molecules could ever do that. And I think we need to think of this more and more as an information science. And, and that's in the 35 years I've been in this business, it's never been that to this extent. I mean, does AI actually make products much safer quicker? Or is it then, you know, you can find things that work, but then it's really the trials that take a longer time. So is the scope of AI limited in biology? I think the scope of AI is greater in biology than in most other fields because we have massive amount of data about a complex system that if we could only tame and direct would massively matter to humanity, otherwise known as our health and our death. And so I can't fathom a place where those techniques of being able to deal with that complexity without being overwhelmed by it. As humans, we are often overwhelmed by just the sheer complexity of individual cells, let alone a trillion cells in our body. So it has massive potential, but it's not a panacea. There are other things we need to do, which is to really think about the regulatory framework within which we're doing drug development so that the collective uh, advances and yeah. progress can take us to a different place. Nubar, thank you so much for joining us today. And again, uh, everyone who wants to read the letter can find it, I think, on your website, Moderna's chair and co-founder, Nubar Afayan. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller, Kaylee Lyons in New York. Our Anna Edwards is here in London. We'll have a full roundup, of course, of markets. European stocks under pressure as the Fed hawks are spurring into the tech route. Technology companies seen really as most sensitive to these higher rates amongst the biggest decliners in the European stock market. We heard yesterday from the Fed Governor Leo Brainard that officials could boost rates as early as March. So we're seeing a repricing in markets. This is Bloomberg. The stock market has been extraordinarily skeptical uh, of the Fed. Could there be another temper tantrum? Maybe, uh, but I think the Fed is actually doing a great job by signaling these things ahead of time. It's pretty clear they're telling us the plan is to go in March at this point. I think the markets are incredibly uh, prepared for it, and they're increasingly pricing this in. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Friday, January 14th. Our top stories today. More signs the Fed is on the verge of raising rates. Vice Chair nominee Lael Brainard points to March as a possibility for a first hike. Fed Governor Christopher Wallace says three increases this year is a good baseline. President Biden completes his overhaul of the central bank's leadership. He'll name a law professor to be the Fed's top banking regulator and will add the first black woman ever to the board. And the big U.S. banks start to report earnings today. The long, elusive growth in loans is likely to make a reappearance.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. It is Friday morning. I'm Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines are in New York, of course. And Kayleigh, a couple of big stories coming together today. We have, of course, a focus on March for the start of rate hikes from the Fed, possibly, and the bank earnings season. That looms large on the, uh, on the agenda. Yeah, and of course, we're going to get some economic data here in the U.S. as well with retail sales at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. So we will definitely be watching for that. Now, as for what the markets looked like overnight, you did see a little bit of catching down in Asia after the losses we saw in the U.S. yesterday. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index down about eight tenths of one percent. But Japan was an underperformer within that. The story there really interesting. Assets rippled across the board after a Reuters report that the Bank of Japan is debating how they can start messaging a potential eventual interest rate hike even before they reach their two percent target. So that weight on equities. It also affected the bond market. The 10 year JGB yield now at just negative 0.019 percent. That is the highest going all the way back to January of 2016 when negative interest rates were first introduced in Japan. You also are seeing that showing up in the Japanese yen. It has had its best week against the U.S. dollar in one and a half years going back uh, to 2020. It right now is trading below 114 or 113.87 or so is where we sit. And then finally, I would point to the Chinese yuan as well. We got some really strong trade data out of China overnight. Exports really, really quite phenomenal. And you're seeing that show up in a stronger yuan today. It's sitting at 635 to the dollar, Matt. All right, very interesting look, especially I think at the currencies there, and we'll focus in on that right now. First off, though, the S&P futures up after the big slump that we saw yesterday. We were wavering for most of the session, and then all of a sudden tech stocks and concerns on concerns about um, the Fed's hawkish tilt uh, plummeted, and now we've got a little bit of a rebound in terms of futures. Ten-year yield coming up a little bit, but still at 174, so it looks like we're up into a brand new range. NYMEX crude also coming up a little bit, but still in the range, 82.70, and that's for WTI. Bitcoin is right now down six tenths of a percent. It had been around 44,000 yesterday at 42,565. But really the interesting thing I think is all other currencies than the dollar. And I'm not necessarily saying Bitcoin is a currency. A lot of people now treat it as a commodity, but the dollar is the worst performing G10 currency of the entire month and maybe G11 if you add Bitcoin. <laughs> G11, there's a new one, Matt. I've got some currencies in just a moment, but first, equity markets here in Europe. And you talk, Matt, about the sell-off in tech stocks. That's working its way, as Kaylee said, through Asia and then into Europe. So we're really reflecting yesterday on Wall Street here for European equity markets. But not everything is selling off. Most sectors in negative territory. Uh, I can show you one, though, that is moving to the upside, and that is the energy sector. Uh, we can show you that that sector is moving a little bit higher this morning. That We've seen oil prices making moves to the upside. Four weeks of gains for energy markets. That's a big focus here. What are we going to see from China on the energy front? That's going to be the big question for oil markets as we go forward from here with the Omicron fight uh, ever present there. I showed you on the map that we were seeing weakness across European equity markets, but I wanted to hold uh, highlight one market that is doing better year to date uh, than many others, and that is the FTSE 100, up by more than 2% year to date, whilst the Nasdaq is down by more than 5 And this has to do with the sector composition, of course, of the London market. It doesn't do very well when all of the focus is on growth stocks and technology. It comes into its own, though, when people are talking about value, energy in particular, and all also financials. The pound getting a boost from that preference for value stocks. The pound up 137. This is a long running trend though. The Bank of England obviously in play when it comes to rate hikes. And those things seem to overshadow all of the politics. There is a little bit of politics. <laughs> we talked about that. Party gate and the like. And I put in EDF. This is an energy provider in France. And Kaylee, this is really interesting because this is the French government that owns a stake in this electricity company, instructing the company to offer cheaper electricity for longer, to cushion the French consumers from higher energy energy prices. You wonder how other governments around the world are going to wrestle with that same question. Yeah, it's a really big question, Anna, and you, of course, are seeing natural gas prices going up in Europe today, still dealing with that energy crisis that we continue to watch. And as for what else we're watching, what is ahead today? U.S. bank earnings, of course, kicking off the season here in the U.S. J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup all will report before the bell. Then ECB President Christine Lagarde is due to speak at 8.30 a.m. New York time. We 
We've heard a lot from Fed speakers lately. What is the European Central Bank thinking about the forward look of monetary policy? And then also at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, we will get U.S. retail sales, falling auto sales and gasoline prices, as well as Omicron shutting down restaurants over the holidays, likely pushed down sales in December. So a very important read on consumer activity, Matt, that I'm sure the Fed will be watching. Yeah, and the Fed is something we got to focus in on right now. Bloomberg has learned that President Biden plans to nominate law professor Sarah Bloom Raskin to be the Federal Reserve's top banking regulator. Biden also plans to name economists Lisa Cook and Philip Jefferson to be governors. Mike McKee, Bloomberg's international economics and policy correspondent, is here to break this down for us. So, Mike, how important is this that we see a switch from Randy Quarles to Sarah Bloom Raskin? Well, that could be a major, major switch, and it's going to be a very interesting confirmation process. Raskin and Jefferson and Cook are mainstream economists, but there are some questions about especially Sarah Bloom Raskin's view of Fed abilities and legal powers. Uh, the, two, the three of them are all, as I said, qualified. Raskin was the Maryland Commissioner of Financial Regulation, a Fed governor, Deputy Treasury Secretary. Now she's a law professor at Duke. Uh, Cook is an economics professor, former dean at Michigan State University, member of the American Economic Association's Executive Committee. Uh, she did a lot of work on international economics, particularly Russia, which could be useful now. Lately, been working on economics for black Americans. She's well known at the Fed. She was, uh, she is a regular attendee at Jackson Hole when they hold Jackson Hole. <laughs> Philip Jefferson yeah. is a research, was a research economist for a couple of years at the Fed, uh, taught at Columbia, and he was at Swarthmore College for almost 20 years. Now he's a dean at Davidson College. And uh, we shouldn't have any trouble, I would imagine, with Cook and Jefferson getting approved. Uh, Kevin Hassett, the uh, former Trump uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, very conservative, said mm -hmm. he would vote for Jefferson no matter what. But it is Raskin who's getting under the skin of Republicans. Uh, she wrote during the financial crisis when the uh, Fed was bailing out everybody in uh, March uh, of 2020 uh, that the decisions the Fed makes on our behalf should build toward a stronger economy with yeah. more jobs in innovative industries, not prop up and enrich dying ones. In other words, hmm. they shouldn't be lending to oil companies, which has Senator Pat Toomey, Republican from Pennsylvania, saying he yeah. really questions her. Serious concerns she abused the Fed's narrow statutory mandates. Well, you talked about decisions the Fed has to make there in the, on the regulatory front. Let's talk about decisions they have to make on the monetary policy front. The latest in the chorus of beating the drum toward March and multiple hikes this year is Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller. He says there could be more than three depending on inflation. Take a listen to what he told Bloomberg yesterday. Three hikes is still a good baseline. Uh, we... We'll have to wait and see what inflation looks like in the second half of the year. If it continues to be high, the case will be made for four, maybe five hikes. So, Mike, as we think about monetary policy and the rate hike path in 2022, could the new nominees, if they are confirmed, change that trajectory tilted in a more dovish direction? They could, but the question is, will they be confirmed? The last three uh, governors appointed to the Fed took almost a year to get confirmed. So if that's the kind of timeline we're looking at, they won't contribute this year. But in 2023, they might be able to lean on the Fed one direction or another. But it does definitely look like uh, Waller, who was out front on this back in December, has uh, pegged it about three rate hikes this year if we get the right uh, inflation readings. Uh, and Kaylee, I should mention, uh, if we get all three of these, if we get Cook and Raskin to add to Brainerd and Bowman, there's going to be a majority of women on the mm -hmm. Fed board for the first time ever. Diversity wins. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Mike McKee. And of course, as Mike said, we have the nominations. The question is, will we get confirmation? That is something the Biden administration is going to have to look forward to now. Speaking of what else is dogging the Biden administration, the U.S. Supreme Court may have re may have rejected Biden's ma mandate for COVID vaccinations or testing, but businesses threatened by Omicron spread might be forced to implement one anyway. That's so they can protect their workers and keep factories open. The court's ruling still lets businesses require vaccinations. Let's get to Emily. Wilkins, Bloomberg government reporter who joins us now from D.C. So, Emily, the Supreme Court making it a lot more difficult for Biden on this front. What is his recourse from here to try and get more Americans vaccinated? 
Yeah, this is definitely a blow to the Biden administration's overall plan to get more Americans vaccinated. It should be noted that while the mandate on businesses was struck down, the court did hold up a different mandate on health care workers in nursing homes, hospitals, other medical areas that receive Medicare and Medicaid funding. So that does at least a little bit advance some of what the Biden administration is trying to do. Really, the administration's hands are, are pretty tied here. I mean, they could try and make some more specific mandates mandates like the one that we saw for health care workers. But at this point, it's kind of becoming clear that if they want to have uh, these mandates for individuals to get vaccinated, that's going to have to happen at a much more local level, either from individual companies, individual uh, cities, states uh, that might have to, those might have to be the individuals to really move forward here on these mandates. Of course, President Biden, he's tried a lot of messaging in terms of getting people vaccinated, really emphasizing the need and the importance as it goes forward, uh, but it's a difficult thing to do uh, given this the number of Americans who are very resistant to getting the vaccine. Mm. Emily, thanks very much. Emily Wilkins, Bloomberg government for us there in Washington. Uh, and that's certainly one of our focuses. Another focus then, Matt, is going to be really on what's going on in the banking sector. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be watching for earnings out from uh, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citi. Citigroup says 99% of its U.S. employees have complied with its vaccine mandate, one of the strictest on Wall Street, by the way. Goldman Sachs is delaying its return to office for U.S. staff by two weeks, and this all comes as bank earnings kick off, as I said, uh, J.P.M. Citi and Wells Fargo reporting today. Let's get more with Shanali Vasek, Bloomberg's Wall Street correspondent. You and I were talking about this yesterday. And I said, you know, what happens to all of these vaccine mandates? We were talking, I think, about uh, Blackstone with its boosters. If the Supreme Court strikes down um, the Biden administration's uh, push for it, how do these banks react? It differs across regions. I think Bloomberg Opinion's Paul Davies put this in a really good way. If you're in Europe, for example, you're going to have a hard time figuring out whether your uh, employees are actually vaccinated or not, if they're not going to answer whether they are. With that said, the banks are moving very quickly before any discussion of what the Supreme Court may or may not do. So as you see, for Citigroup, um, Employees are getting vaccinated in order to stay employed at the bank, whereas at other firms which have not taken such a hard line, people are getting vaccinated to be able to get ahead at a very busy time for the, mm. for the industry. Sh Shanali, good morning. Yeah, it's a really complex picture, isn't it? And the more this gets pushed down to local level or even just corporate level, the more granular it becomes, the more uh, more diff different uh, policies will be in different regions and different companies. Let me ask you about the bank earnings season proper then. I, I mean, savings and that buildup of savings that we th saw during the pandemic was something that stood in the way of bank lending over recent quarters. Is that finally in the rearview mirror, Shanali? Is there a different story this time around? You see improvement already, especially in credit cards, which in the most recent period had seen the biggest jump out of any loan business here. Very good news for a bank like JP Morgan, like Citigroup, two of the biggest card issuers. And the thing that's really stunning here, though, with that jump back in the consumer, there's still a big focus on investment banking and trading. I mean, this quarter alone, JP Morgan is still expected to bring in $3.4 billion in fixed income trading revenue, more than $5 billion in total trading revenue, much more than just at the investment bank in a record year and a record quarter for many firms. So what does that mean at the end? A volatile business is going to have a lot of pressure to perform in a competitive environment, hmm. especially when we know for example, Goldman Sachs and its commodities business is only bringing $2.2 billion alone. The competition will be as stiff as ever. All right, Bloomberg Shanali Basik, thank you so much. And all three of the banks reporting today are trading higher in pre-market trading. And as for what other stocks are on the move this morning, I do want to point to two moving in tandem, and that is casino operators. Wynn Resorts and Las Vegas Sands are both higher. Of course, they're both U.S.-based, but they have big operations in Macau. And Macau authorities released new rules about casino operations in that gambling enclave overnight. And it indicates that all six operators there will have their licenses renewed for a period of about 10 to 13 years. So both of those stocks are up nearly five percent in pre-market trading. One mover to the downside, though, is Peloton. It is getting kicked out of the NASDAQ 100 index. It's going to be replaced by a freighter. Uh, Dominion Freight Line is actually, Old Dominion Freight Line is going to be replacing it. That is effective as of January 24th. But of course, this is a stock, Anna, already down 80 percent over the last year. Wow. It's lower by the better part of about 1 percent this morning.
That wasn't all because of one particular TV programme. I can't believe that. Other factors <laughs> in the mix, of course. Uh, coming up on this programme, Susanna Streeter, Senior Investments and Markets Analyst at Hargreaves Lansdowne, will dig into her strategy for the year ahead. Uh, we'll stay on bank earnings. We will talk to Filippo Alawati, Federated Hermes Head of Financials. He must be watching that return of loan growth as well. But what about the cost base? Plus, later today, we'll hear from the CFO of Wells Fargo. That's at 4 p.m. New York time, 9 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kaylee Lines. Anna Edwards is with us in London. It's Friday, people, uh, and that would be great if you weren't long the dollar. A lot of our viewers, of course, are just naturally. It's the worst performing currency among the G10 over the last month. We saw that the Bloomberg dollar index hit a high in November of 1190, and we've now come down to 1160. What's interesting to me is that's happening even as rates are rising. Venrom, currency and rate strategist at Bloomberg MLive, joins us now to explain why, Ven, what's going on? Morning, Matt. It's a bit of a conundrum what's going on with the dollar, uh, albeit it's just happened all this week. Uh, what is surprising is, you know, real rates are going to go higher in the U.S. And we have got a situation where the dollar is tanking. That, to me, suggests that, you know, there is some profit taking on the table. Uh, there's there's some profit taking and uh, and it's, it's also got to do with the fact that, you know, these are start of the year uh, inflows and outflows, capital flows that are pushing the dollar one way or the other around. Now, the issue is, uh, we, this is n so much noise, not so much signal, because as I said, real rate differentials have, if anything, moved in favor of the dollar yen, and and in, in indeed of the broader dollar as well. So you would expect mm. the dollar to strengthen, and I do think that what happened this week is, is an aberration, not the norm for 2022. OK, that's an interesting point then, Ven. So maybe we are not seeing a new trend in the dollar. Maybe this is uh, an exception, what we've seen in the first 14 days. Let me ask you about what we saw on Wall Street yesterday and no doubt will continue to be a theme for us, and that is the tech sector. Heavy selling on the Nasdaq and tech names on the S&P uh, as well. Is this something that you think can be turned around by earnings season, Ven, or is that uh, a reach too far? Well, I don't know about the earnings, about the short-term movements, but if you look at it, Anna, I mean, at the moment, uh, Nasdaq, uh, Nasdaq 100 is turning, uh, trading at a price earnings, forward price earnings multiple, shall we say, of about four per, uh, 25, uh, 25 times. So, i.e., the earnings yield is about 4%. Now, in an environment where the Treasury 10-year yield is 170, give or take, and then expected to rise, maybe it's as the Fed starts raising rates, uh, the... It, equity risk premium on NASDAQ is not very high and it's not enough of a compensation for investors to be buying into NASDAQ, which is why we have seen that the NASDAQ has fallen much more sharply than the S&P, where the comparable earnings yield is 5% is pretty decent, but mm. 4% in an environment where the Fed is talking about three or four hikes this year seems untenable to me. Ven, thanks very much. Ven Ram from the Bloomberg Markets Live team. Thanks very much for giving us your thoughts this Friday. And if you want more market analysis from the Markets Live team, MLIV Go. That is the function to use on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now let's get the first word news and President Biden has all but conceded defeat on major voting rights legislation. A key Democrat, Senator Kirsten Sinema, announced her refusal to go along with changing Senate rules to get a bill passed a Republican filibuster. The president told reporters he doesn't know if Democrats can get the measure through Congress now. Volkswagen is the latest automaker to get caught in China's latest coronavirus outbreak in the city of Tianjin. A production plant operated by VW's joint venture with the Chinese company has been closed since Monday, along with a gearbox maker. That may hurt production of the Audi Q3 and the VW Tehran SUV. 
And for a second time, Australia has canceled the visa of Novak Djokovic. Immigration Minister Alex Hawke overrode a court ruling that temporarily prevented the government from deporting the unvaccinated tennis star. Hawke said it was in the public interest to do so. No response yet from Djokovic or his lawyers. But they have a limited time window, Anna, because the Australian Open begins on Monday. Mm. And maybe he's not going to be playing in it. Yeah, absolutely. We'll still wait to see. Uh, coming up on the program, Susanna Street, a senior investment and markets mm -hmm. analyst at Hargreaves Lansdowne. As I mentioned at the top of the hour, the FTSE 100 outperforming other major markets, certainly between Europe and the US this year. Is she buying into the FTSE right now? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Here is what you need to know. Signs are pointing to the Federal Reserve raising interest rates in the next few months. The nominee for Fed Vice Chair, Lael Brainard, says there could be an increase in March. Meanwhile, Fed Governor Christopher Waller says three rate hikes this year is a good baseline. President Biden will nominate law professor Sarah Bloom Raskin to be the Fed's top banking regulator. That's seen as a nod to pro-regulation progressives. The president also will name economist Lisa Cook as a governor. She'd be the first black woman on the Fed's board. And JP Morgan kicks off earnings season for the big U.S. banks today. We're likely to see the return of loan growth that eluded them for most of last year. That is a look at what you need to know this morning. Matt, what do we need to know about the markets and how they are positioned? Well, we need to know that we could get a little bit of a rebound from the drop yesterday, right? We had uh, the S&P 500 at the end of yesterday's session fall pretty significantly, about 1.5%. That was pulled down by tech stocks on concerns about the Fed hawkishness. The NASDAQ, I think, was down 2.5%. Now we see a little bit of a lift in futures, although, to be honest, it's really not much. So let's watch this because there's so much going on today. Kaylee pointed out there's retail data coming out. We've got this Fed debate started. You got the Bloomberg dollar index down at 11.63. Um, we've been talking about this, the worst performing currency of the G10 this month. NYMEX crude continues to hold its strength. 82.82 for West Texas Intermediate and Bitcoin down just about 1% at 42,414. Kaylee, what do you see in the pre-market? Well, I am taking a look at the financials, Matt, because of course, in addition to retail sales and Fed Watch, we are also watching for U.S. bank earnings. And actually, they're all pretty much higher in early hours trading. The select sector spider for the financials, which basically gives us an indication of how the sector as a whole is trading, is up about eight tenths of one percent. And when we look at the individual stocks that are reporting today, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo and Citigroup, they also are all higher to the tune of about one and a quarter percent or maybe even a little bit more. And I would note it's not just a move up today, Anna. There's been some pretty significant run up in these stocks so far in 2022. J.P. Morgan up six percent year to date. Citi's up 12 and well Wells Fargo is up almost 17%. So the bar's pretty high mm. going into these results. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking to one colleague on the Markets Live blog earlier who was making that exact point, Kaylee, saying that the bar is pretty high because of what we've seen on the yield curve. Expectation has been rising around the banking sector. How will what we hear from U.S. banks filter back down the chain, if you like, into European equity markets? Well, this is the setup we have right now. The European equity market's down by seven cents of one percent. One sector that moves to the upside, though, is the energy sector. Uh, energy stocks up by half a percent because we have seen that higher energy price of late. That plays well relatively for the FTSE 100, so it is to the downside but it relatively outperforms the others. Other European markets having a worse day, the ones that focus on technology in particular. The pound also up this morning, also having a decent time, up by two-tenths of 1%, 137.29. This is a continuation of a theme we've seen for a little while, and this is the Bank of England policy. This is also the, attraction, uh, the attractiveness of the FTSE 100 and its sector weightings. That is bringing money into the pound, it seems, and, and so the market's ignoring some of the politics that's happening. Uh, we also have politics in the mix when it comes to energy markets right now. EDF is an electricity supplier over in France. And this is a really interesting global story because the French government has asked EDF to supply energy to customers for a longer period at a lower price and so cushioning them from higher energy prices. And you just wonder how other businesses around the world are going to do, other governments, sorry, are going to call on companies to do the same. Matt. Wow. At the expense of EDF shareholders, I guess. Um, supporting the French consumer. Joining us now is Susanna Streeter, Hargreaves Lansdowne Senior Investment and Market Analyst. And before we get to that, Susanna, I just want to get your take on European stocks. We have 
just uh, seen an avalanche of analysts and market participants saying this is the year for European stocks, finally. Um, and I'm looking at the discount for our listeners on Bloomberg Radio. I'll tell you, we are showing a chart here uh, of European stocks compared to uh, U.S. peers. The discount continues to grow. Susanna, what is causing this, and can European stocks turn around and, and catch up this year? Well, that is the question. And I do think that if you look at uh, the London market, so uh, the FTSE uh, 100 uh, weighted more towards miners, of course, financials and uh, uh, defence stocks and the like, um, rather than tech stocks. And that is why, of course, it's been really lagging in recent years when we've seen the huge surge in tech stock valuations. Now uh, we're seeing that correction and actually going forward, it certainly could help. Uh, the FTSE uh, regain uh, some of that shine that it's certainly lost. And that is partly as well, of course, to do with the Brexit effect. Um, we've seen that ever since the vote for Brexit, that UK assets really have been undervalued. So um, with the FTSE stuff full of uh, diversified miners, also financials, mm. the likes of Lloyds Bank, where um, an increase in net income margins really could help or with uh, interest rate, rate rises on the way, um, certainly the prospects do look brighter. And so, Susanna, is this to, to be sustained then, this outperformance by the FTSE 100? Because if we cast our minds back to, uh, to this time last year, we had a lot of analysts talking about European stocks overall and value stocks uh, doing well versus the United States. And so uh, we had similar conversations last year and then it lasted into the spring and then it faded. Do you think this year is going to be different? I do think that this year, um, certainly with global growth, firmly back on track and also uh, miners able to pass on the higher inflation rates in terms of the products uh, that they supply. Um, really, they can be more resilient in a higher inflationary environment. Obviously, as well, you know, we've got travel stocks expecting more of a rebound there. Um, airlines uh, listed on uh, the London market. So certainly there, there are kind of a, still a reopening play that I don't feel um, has fully uh, come out. So I think that could benefit as well. Um, now, I do think, of course, that there are headwinds. So we, we've got um, tensions on the uh, Ukraine-Russian border. Um, that certainly is causing some uncertainty. Oh, we don't know what will happen. Diplomatic moves are being closely watched. Again, as well, in a higher inflationary environment, um, certainly uh, those stocks focused on consumer spending, reliant on consumer spending, uh, it's going to be an uncertain time ahead. We're already seeing that, for example, today, uh, FTSE 100, like so B&M European Value Retail, which has done particularly well during the pandemic, slipping back because um, there is a concern um, mm -hmm. that with so many other grocers, for example, getting into the value space, they could suffer. And actually, there's so much competition uh, there, which really could have an impact on margins. Yeah. So it's certainly not uh, an easy an easy run ahead still lots of uncertainty Oh, there always seems to be uncertainty, Susanna. And I want to talk about the bond market read through into equities as well, because just this morning, we're starting to see the bond market really waking up across the curve. Yields moving higher to the tune of about four basis points from twos out to tens. The 10-year yield now sitting right around that 175 level. It has been a very, very quick move higher. And I'm wondering how much upside you think there is in yields and what the read through is going to be for equities, specifically growth equities. Yeah, well, I do th certainly think that there is a, a way to go. And we are likely to see, as a result, uh, those high growth stocks wobble yet again and lose value because, of course, um, uh, the value of their future earnings are dented in a high yield environment. And we're already seeing that uh, playing out, aren't we, uh, this week? And yes, although there could be um, somewhat of a pause today, I don't think it's going to last uh, for the long term. I certainly think as though uh, this is going to keep going. Obviously, as far as the central bank policy mm. is concerned, um, there is a worry that they won't go far enough in reining in inflation. And we saw that, for example, when the Bank of England moved surprisingly to increase uh, the base rate. Actually, uh, stocks lifted, including tech stocks, almost in a wave of re relief that there was action being taken. So if uh, the Federal Reserve doesn't move now as quickly as is expected in terms of those multiple uh, rate rises this year, 
I do actually think that there might be some concern rippling through nevertheless. And, yeah. and so it's it's highly sensitive environment right now. They're on a very tricky tightrope. If they don't do enough, uh, I think that uh, there will be a wobble. If they do too much, particularly for those high growth tech stocks, uh, there could mm. be yet another kind of fear um, rippling through as we've seen. Susanna, thanks very much for your time. Susanna Streeter, Hargreaves Lansdowne, Senior Investment uh, and Markets Analyst. Have a good weekend when we get there. Coming up on this programme, US Bank Earnings. Filippo Aluati, Federated Hermes Head of Financials, will delve into what to expect from US Financials as they get ready to report today. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later on today, the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Andrew Holness. That's at 2.30 in New York, 7.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Well, it's almost time. U.S. bank earnings kick off today with J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo and Citigroup all reporting before the bell this morning. Joining us now is Filippo Aluati, Federated Hermes Head of Financials. So, Filippo, let's talk about loans because in the pandemic era, we've seen a lot of stimulus. Loan growth has been very, very hard to come by. Is the fourth quarter when it finally started to show up? Yeah, good morning. Yeah, it, it looks like it is. And I think, uh, as you said, also, we've been waiting for long growth uh, for quite a few quarters. I think most of last year and a part of uh, um, 2020. And uh, eventually, this long growth has come about. And I think also the Q4 on the Federal, Federal Reserve data, it was uh, more than, it was, we went in double digit, this increase. And actually, the, the first time is really across the border, from CNI to consumer to commercial real estate. So I think uh, the bank Bank's management, they, very, they were very vocal respecting this longer, and it seems like finally it has come. It seems like uh, $25 million over five years is the going rate for big swinging executives on Wall Street in terms of bonuses, Filippo. Are we going to see just a, a, a record bonus season this year, and is that going to keep people um, in their place, or are they moving around nonetheless? Um, well, let me put it away. The um, um, say the investment banking uh, year 2021 was uh, stellar. I think one of the best, the strongest on record, based on the allergic data. Um, I think so. This is a. Um, Surely, surely, in a, a um, adjoint for, for the banks, because of course, so the best people they will want to get uh, uh, pay more, and of course, so they will push up also the compensation rate for the large flow monster, the JP Morgan, the City, the Bank of America of this world. Now, of course, so this is a bit tricky because we know um, there is a new uh, appointee by the Biden administration in DC, and we we'll discuss this later. So I think uh, there is a um, also difficult balance to strike because uh, maybe be over generous today um, lieutenants could be i mean could play badly in, yeah. in this so we'll see this we we can go ahead and talk about it now sarah bloom raskin is coming in and clearly she's going to be um uh more aggressive when it comes to bank regulation than randy quarles or at least that's the idea um is she going to push back against these big bonuses i mean when you hear about people getting 20, 25, 30 million dollars a year, um, you know, the average American has to ask uh, himself or herself, what are they doing? Yeah, I mean, so this is a, a clearly a very, um, uh, say, uh, unpopular political football. So I would expect also to be, um, say, not the primants, but at least some uh, um, voices on concern. I think so. Where really that could change is more on the capital capital front. I mean, some of the some of the streets is expecting. Uh, 100% payout ratio at some of the banks for the, for the year 2022. And I think also if you look at the, uh, how the capital buffer could increase, and in my opinion, will increase this year, and this nominee, I think it's uh, it's a clear indication we're going down this path. And of course, one people may start wondering whether in America maybe the payout ratio is uh, uh, as good as it can possibly get. And I mean, also the increase on the share backs will be very limited because that's where the Fed really can dent. Uh, the bank. Mm. 
Philippe, good morning. One of the things that, of course, has uh, driven up that pot that can be distributed to shareholders has been investment banking revenues in recent quarters. Uh, do you expect that to continue, Filippo? And if it does in the short term, what is the sort of medium term outlook? Yeah, good morning, Anna. I, I think it's uh, versus last year, I think that's what we probably will have less from trading. I mean, last year we had the, the big uh, spark waves, which seems to be waning off slightly or more, depending on where we ask. And of course, I mean, we um, expect uh, still strong corporate finance, M&A, spin-off and uh, corporate finance activities. And I think also there is a very uh, huge um, backlog of, of deals. And I think that's all, all the investment banks, they pitch in the corporate on doing you know, for uh, the merger. And I think also this will continue also because all the private equity funds are awash with equity and they're raising new funds. So this, I think, will continue. I think potentially if the Fed, as they said, will retreat slowly from the capital markets, because that was the, if you want, so the new factor in the COVID crisis, then of course uh, I would expect maybe FIC will do better than, uh, than, than equity this year, equity trading. And of course, I mean, we, we know there is this commodity boom. Uh, um, I think Goldman was uh, pre-flagged as having one of the stronger commodity trading quarter in its history. So I think this is also a team considering also the, um, say, the bottlenecks in energy supplies. I wonder about the dividend payout and buybacks, Filippo. You just mentioned the effect that maybe Sarah Bloom Raskin could have. I'm looking at the KBW index, for example, dividend ratio of 2.1%. Uh, and the index over the last five years has underperformed the S&P when you look at total return. Um, so surely uh, bank shareholders are watching closely to see what kind of payouts they're going to get. What do you expect? Yeah, that's, I think, it's a decree of the, the crux of the debate. I think also the issue here is in, in a scenario in a year like this, so inflationary with Fed uh, hiking rates, uh, tapering, uh, tapering uh, QE, and potentially also steeper curve. Would you rather own the universal banks? They are more diversified, they're large, they're also the scale in marketing tech, or would you rather own the, say, the regional banks? Historically, the regional, um, in this kind of environment, have outperformed the universal banks. So I think possibly if the feds get this uh, unwinding of the QE rightly, and I think it's a very complex, uh, to be fair, it's a very complex exercise, then maybe the regional banks, so if you get this long growth, maybe that's a cleaner way to play this uh, long growth and increase uh, net interest income. And in the case, mm. I would see maybe scope for more uh, dividend increase or share buybacks at the regional versus the universal banks, because the universal banks, so they more easily targeted by the Fed, if you see what I mean. OK, so we'll keep an eye on the politics in 2022, it sounds like. Filippo, thanks so much. Filippo Alawati, Federated Hermes Head of Financials. Later today, we'll be speaking with the CFO of Wells Fargo. That's at 4 p.m. New York time and 9 p.m. here in London. This is Greenberg. I definitely see rate increases coming as early as March even. Three hikes is still a good baseline. Uh, we will have to wait and see what inflation looks like in the second half of the year. We need to get inflation back down in the ballpark of our 2% objective. Our monetary policy is focused on getting inflation back down to 2% while sustaining a recovery that includes everyone. This is our most important task. Fed policymakers commenting on the sky-high inflation numbers and hikes on the horizon. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, joins us now. And, Tom, we have um, some new picks for the Fed. Initially, I would kind of shake this off as something that only you and Pharaoh care about and uh, no viewer <laughs> wants to see. But we just talked to Filippo Alawati, who said Sarah Bloom Raskin could actually have an effect on the dividends and payouts that banks make to shareholders. Well, I don't know about the dividend pay 
out to shareholders. That's sort of inside baseball. But I would say these are always important decisions. And certainly, there's a political construct here, which will make for uh, really interesting hearings. I would note that Lisa Cook took her PhD at Berkeley with Barry Eichengreen, who's been a wonderful friend of the show over the years. And these are two first-rate academics in terms of Johnson uh, and Cook. We'll talk about that. Michael McKee to give us a brief, I believe, in the 8 o'clock hour uh, this morning. My brief this morning is oil up, futures up, everything up. And I'm just using oil as a global metric here. Um, Brent crude breaking out on a monthly basis, 85, 86 a barrel. Nowhere near the 110 level of the angst of a number of years ago, but <clears throat> migrating up to where the uh, media capturing $100 a barrel level. Well, and of course, higher oil prices means higher prices at the pump for American consumers. They're pricing higher prices really across the board, Tom. And we get retail <coughs> sales day to day expecting a decline for the month of December. When we talk about a data dependent Fed, how important is this number this morning? It, it's important because of the makeup of the economy. As you know, we parse out retail, uh, Kaylee. The control group is what I'll be looking at, and we'll do that at 830. But it's the size of the consumer within the economy. It's an important bellwether. I'd say it's more important now than it was 10 years ago. I don't know why that is, but, you know, it, it's definitely something worth looking at. But it's this whole bet, as you just heard from Dr. Waller of the St. Louis Fed, a governor now at the Fed. He's very good in research. And as he said, what a shock. They have to wait for more data. Yep, data dependency always. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, thank you so much. We'll watch out for those retail sales numbers at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. But before that, I'll be watching big bank earnings. J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo reporting at 7 a.m. City will follow around 8 a.m. We're going to be watching investment banking. How much have those advisory fees grown thanks to the M&A boom? Do we finally start to see some loan growth showing up is going to be a really big one. And then, of course, the guidance going forward, especially on the net interest income, I think will be interesting given we are now in a higher rate environment what banks have not uh, been able to enjoy for some time. And also, Matt, when it comes to just color commentary on the conference calls, whatever Jamie Dimon and Jane Frazier say about return to office, vaccine ma mandates, the outlook for the economy in general, I think will be very interesting to see. Definitely. You know, I I'm watching Volkswagen right now. It's the latest automaker to be ensnared by Chinese COVID plant shutdowns. And um, we've seen others. Toyota has had uh, problems as well. Airbus has had problems as well. So these production lines are vulnerable. And, you know, I'm just terrified that this is going to come um, to Dearborn, to Detroit. I don't want to see the F-150 or GMC Sierra line shut down <laughs> for any reason. We're in such a, a tight supply demand situation mm. that any shutdown means I'm going to have to wait an extra two, three, four months for a new truck. And that worries me. And we just can't have that. Yeah, our colleagues at Bloomberg Opinion, Trevedi and Fickling, pointing out that 28% of the world's value added in manufacturing comes from China. So if you think we saw supply chain disruptions last year, if China really does clamp down because of Omicron, then things could get worse, not better from here. Mm -hmm. uh, let me talk to you about uh, what I'm watching today, which is the fate of Novak Djokovic, the tennis player, of course, in Australia. His visa has been revoked once again. We understand the latest news lies here is that Djokovic is going to seek to file a formal application by Friday night. He's going to be interviewed on Saturday. So in terms of what we're watching, this is somebody who's not going to have a very quiet weekend. We'll see if he ever makes it onto the court. Raises really important question that tie into vaccine mandates and how elite sports people are treated in that context. Uh, more on that shortly, no doubt. More Bloomberg surveillance lies ahead. Bank earnings, a big theme. This is Bloomberg.